This is the 6th of August, uh, Tuesday, 1991, and the title of the tape is Noah and the Diversity Principle. Eight days ago, I received a telephone call from Everett Purcell, representing a creationist group in Orange County, uh, inviting me tentatively to uh, give a lecture on Genesis 10 related subject matter, that is, creationist subject matter of my type, on Saturday, November the 9th of this year, 1991. I proceeded to sketch out a lecture text manuscript in the next couple of days after that. Uh, but this manuscript has not been typed, and because my wife normally does typing for me on a computer typewriter that she recently acquired, and she won't be back in town until the end of the month, I thought I might read the manuscript into the tape. And of course, because the manuscript really is not in its absolutely final stages, I might make corrections as I go along, and I might do a certain amount of improvisation, because after all, this uh, manuscript is just supposed to be the basis for a lecture, although I would like to have it typed and copied so that uh, I can disseminate that to whoever is interested on the November the 9th. I've given the title already, Noah, and the Diversity Principle. It's broken into subsections, the first of which is a background, meaning a personal background concerning my interest in what I would call Noahic study, the study of the family of Noah after the flood and their fabrication of the nations and the creation of Gentile traditions after the flood. <clears throat> My interest in Noahic study began in 1963 when I noticed a coincidence of names between Babel and Erech at the head of Nimrod's kingdom in Genesis 10.10 and the two chief islands of the Pelu group in the southwestern Pacific. Babel and Erech, north and south, in Akkad and Sumer, as Babel and Akkad and, and Erech and Sumer, seemed to be echoed in Babel Thuop and Uruk Thapel, north and south, especially because the original Sumerian pronunciation of biblical Eric is now rendered Uruk. I had taken an interest in the Sumerians two years earlier after discovering them in a Scientific American article. That was 1961. The Sumerian civilization turned out to be a great encouragement to me in Christian apologetics. At the same time that some Christian scholars found it a discouragement or an awkward challenge. That is, I noticed a difference in how the Sumerian race and what it stood for impacted on some Christian scholars and how this race impacted on me. And that difference is a, a point of departure for the enti entire Genesis 10 testimony. A difference of viewpoint, a difference of attitude towards the same phenomenon, the Sumerian race and the study of that race, Sumerology. In accounting for this difference of attitude, I eventually discovered a set of purely traditional Christian assumptions that struck me then and strike me now as inadequate. Obviously, the scriptures are not inadequate for any fundamentalist, and I am a fundamentalist, and I take the Bible literally, although I also believe in symbolic logic. I certainly take the Bible literally, and so I'm a fundamentalist. But some traditional Christian assumptions about how to read and interpret early Genesis strike me as inadequate. And that inadequacy is reflected in attitudes toward the Sumerian race and what they stand for. <clears throat> I encountered one of those assumptions, that is an alien or inadequate assumption, when a friend of mine mentioned my observation on the Pelu Islands to a pastor on the East Coast. The pastor wrote back that he doubted that Moses knew anything about the Pacific. Of course, Moses knew nothing about the Pacific, as far as I know. My obvious point was that Noahic ancestors of the Micronesians, people of the Pelu Islands, took part in the universal history of the post-Diluvian world community, not in the Pacific, but somewhere in the Middle East, and specifically in Iran, because other scholars and myself have traced the Austronesian linguistic stock, including the Micronesians, to Iran. Took, took part, uh, these, these ancestors of the Micronesians, responsible for the names Babel Thu up and Urk Thapel, participated in the Noahic post-Diluvian history somewhere in the Middle East, not in the Pacific, and left the names to their descendants no matter where they migrated. In their case, of course, Micronesia. The mystery was why such a simple explanation did not occur to the pastor. <clears throat> 
I suppose that the answer lay with a certain logical sloth which shunned the dynamic of the Noahic world community. Or perhaps there was a democratic motive, a very subtle interplay between the limitations of democratic thought and the limitations of modern, democratized, evangelical thought. Perhaps there was a democratic motive that instinctively shunned the imperialism of such a community, such a Noahic world community. Because Israel was a single nation planted in a single geographic location, some Christians may conclude that an international imperial point of view is foreign to the Bible. Take, for example, the Sumerians. Why did I thrill over the example of the Sumerians while some Christians found them a troublesome problem? As non-Semitic speakers, speaking a language radically diverse from the Semitic languages, non-Semitic speakers at the root of Mesopotamian civilization, they have dislodged the Semites, and that means, of course, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Hebrews and other uh, the Canaanites and other Semitic-speaking people, they have dislodged the Semites from monopolizing the earliest origins of Mesopotamian civilization. To me, this Sumerian, radically non-Semitic presence in Mesopotamia was a thrilling confirmation of the basic Genesis premise that Mesopotamia of the Tower of Babel was an international zone. Wasn't it, in fact, an international zone? I found that some Christian scholars were reasoning in a completely different way. Because the Old Testament was written in a Semitic language, it was somehow felt that the honor and reputation of the Bible was at stake in the role of Semitic speakers in early origins. To reason that way was like suggesting that God dishonored the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, by inspiring the New Testament in Indo-European Greek. Somehow there's a breed of Christian for whom an internationalism of perspective is offensive as though the Canaanites were holy because they spoke Semitic and Greek-speaking Christians were ritually unholy because of their language. Take another case, Ur of the Chaldees, the birthplace of Abram, Abraham. It is self-evident to me that Ur of the Chaldees is the Sumerian Ur, lunar cult center of the Sumerian world. Again I rejoiced and others grieved I made no claim that Abraham was a Sumerian. On the contrary, he was a Semite born in Sumerian Ur because of the same imperial internationalism that made Sumer, inhabited by the Sumerian linguistic stock, subject to Semitic Akkadians. So there was a dual presence, linguistically speaking, in the sumero akkadian Empire. But the pressure against such internationalism led others to suggest that Ur of the Chaldees should not be identified with Sumerian Ur, but with some hypothetical hamlet in traditionally Semitic Syria to the northwest, closer to the charmed circle of Palestine. Such reasoning may make good Judaism, but not good Christianity. Why shouldn't Abraham's origins have been associated with the Sumerians, or the Chinese, or the Indo-Europeans? Was Abraham a Jew? Was his ancestor Noah, father of Ham, a Jew? Obviously not. Noah was the universal father of Gentile mankind, and because Noah was also a righteous man, according to Hebrews 11, there is a great mystery of pre-Abrahamic, non-Jewish right religion in the Bible itself. Even though the salvation plan was completed by Israel, not by the Gentiles, and one obvious reason why it had to be completed by Israel rather than the Gentiles, is the very body of apostate processes that are outlined in early Genesis in the post diluvian world, that is the sin of Ham and the Tower of Babel. And if that weren't sufficient, uh, there, there is more evidence. The origins of idolatry and so forth were all taking place within the 350-year lifetime of Noah after the flood, and therefore the Gentile apostasy was there at Gentile origins. No question about it. I don't moot that point for an instant. That's one of the reasons why I'd accept the short chronologies at face value, because I don't want to whitewash the Gentile people at the same time I'm stressing the glory, the international imperial glory of the Gentiles. I don't want to whitewash them spiritually because I believe that they condemn themselves 
to theological perdition, so to speak, within the lifetime of Noah. And the call of Abraham occurred, uh, it's my opinion that Abraham was born two years after the death of Noah, that is 352 years after the flood. And that Abraham uh, represents a new initiative and a new dispensation because the Gentiles had very quickly, rapidly forfeited their tremendous, tremendous privileges to, uh, well, they never forfeited the pri privilege to make nations, to create nations, but they did forfeit the privilege to inaugurate right religion and a salvation plan, which obviously belongs to the children of Abraham, to the Israelites, and to the Jews, even the tribe of Judah. Uh, there's a focus there. Thesis, a, su a subsection of the lecture uh, titled Thesis. God ordained diversity of all kinds from Adam's family forward. Now that's the first part of the thesis, and that contradicts the traditional view held from St. Augustine forward, and probably others even before St. Augustine, that there was unity of language before Babel. The other way to understand the text is that the unity of language established in early Genesis is the sin under judgment at the Tower of Babel. Because obviously there's, there's a sin. And it's my opinion that the sin is the linguistic unity and that the entire passage is based on the sin of linguistic unity. And that would only be a sin if linguistic unity had not existed beforehand, which in my opinion it did not because of the thesis. God ordained diversity of all kinds from Adam's family forward. And Noah's family worked in cooperation with God to create controlled and meaningful sets of races, linguistic stocks, urban cult centers, and the like. By controlled and meaningful sets, I refer to schemes such as the tribes of Genesis 49 with their animal symbols given by Jacob, the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3, the ascending virtues of 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, the seven dispensations, all seven, all seven, very important point, the four faculties of the great commandment, that is heart, mind, soul, and strength, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the like. <clears throat> Designs in the text of Genesis 2, 4, and 5 suggest that Adam's family was created interracial through polar racial characteristics in the family of Adam and Eve. Religious cult differences among the various names of God arose among the descendants of Adam and his sons, and these cult distinctions were soon matched by linguistic differences even before the flood. Consequently, Noah's family of eight persons had an international character from the outset of their corporate life. They were never a people or nation, but an international, feudal, imperial aristocracy who created the nations from the top down rather than from the bottom up, from the popular bottom up. That's a key point. That's the key point. The Genesis 10 science is for Christians, not for Democrats. It's authoritarian. It deals with the origins of high, sublime, aristocratic authority. And the crux point is that instead of being determined by popular sovereignty, the nations were created from the top down by people who pre-existed the people, by aristocrats who pre-existed the people. All eight survivors of the flood were a body of aristocrats, not, not a people, not a populace. And their initi initiatives pre-existed the nations just as God pre-existed the creation, something that Democrats can't tolerate, so they've turned to Darwinism. They don't want a God who pre-exists his creation, and they do not want aristocratic nation founders who pre-existed their nations. Why? because those particular truths are non-democratic truths and threaten the everlasting sway of democratic principles. Democracy emerges as a very limited thing when you understand that God pre-existed his creation and that Noah's family pre-existed the nations that they created from the top down. And referring further to this family, Noah's family, their extremely high longevities in comparison with their descendants, as outlined in Genesis 11, intensified their aristocratic image to the point of deification and therefore explained the mystery of the human gods in Psalm 82, together with a so-called euhemeristic mystery of highly anthropomorphic deities among the Sumerians, East Indians, Greeks, and others. <clears throat> 
Their salvation experience in the flood, together with their imperialistic privileges, were so intense that the pagan nations who arose from them remained obsessively spellbound at their glory and were incapable of rendering what had happened to them in plain prose. Instead, they render it in the poetry of mythology and in the art of statues and, and religious rituals related to those statues and ultimately with idolatry. And idolatry is not just the worship of statues because you have to go back to the original meaning of the word eidolon in Greek. It is an image that deceives and there were very definite patterns of deception in the early post-Diluvian world and in the pagan system of origins. I probably don't have time on this tape to discuss just how deceptive it was, but I've, I've been studying the sin of Ham further, its motivation, and I believe that one of, the, one of the phases of deception that was practiced from the very beginning of the Gentile rebellion in the family of Ham is that Ham actually pretended and that he passed himself off to whoever would believe him in the early post-believing community, that he was older than Noah. And that, as a matter of fact, um, his sons, a pair of his sons, were older than Shem and Japheth. It was an outflanking phenomenon, and this was possible because of the slow aging process and that this whole process of under, uncovering his father's nakedness, nakedness and so forth had to do with foisting a tremendous lie on the early post diluvian community, namely that Noah was a kind of usurper and that Ham and his dynastic wife, and I term the white matriarch, actually were claiming to have priority of origins and therefore of authority over Noah. And that was a deception, and it was a deception that took root and that continued to operate uh, to leaven the whole lump. Even though the enterprise was glorious, it was a ruined or vitiated glory. In any case, the glory was so great that it contributed to the problem because it made the pagan descendants of Noah's family obsessed with them to the extent that they could not get a distance from them. They couldn't get that note of sobriety, really, that you see in early Genesis. It's very clear that the glory of Gentile origins, as I perceive it, is veiled in the presentation of Genesis. There's a stress on the humiliating aspect of the flood itself and of the humiliating aspects of what happened after the flood, the no nakedness of, of Noah, the sin of Ham, the Tower of Babel, all of it rather humiliating and very little of the glory shining through unless you reason uh, rigorously. And then you can begin to see just how glorious the post-Diluvian enterprise was. The next subsection of the lecture deals with the principle of controlled diversity. That's in the title, because I don't think it's possible to understand the origin of the nations without understanding God's principle of controlled diversity, the same principle I see in the seven churches of Revelation 2-3. And here I become rather polemic, and I think that I need to become rather polemic. And this is the kind of polemic that, for the time being, divides one Christian from another and requires bema disposition, that is, Christ eventually must intervene and vindicate whoever needs to be vindicated because here are some very real differences, uh, the kinds of differences that we see in the history of professed Christianity, this sort of tension that exists between the Catholics and Protestants or between the different denominations or between the amills and pre-mills. This is another one, and it concerns me personally. The principle of controlled diversity. Christian scholars have not always appreciated the logical significance of biblical schemes such as the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. Trained in secular universities in empirical and skeptical modes of thought, that we all realize that much of the scientific uh, scholarly world community follows a philosophy. I've just been reviewing this in Andrew Stewart's uh, book on Greek sculpture, a very useful book in many ways, but it's shot through with the philosophy that faith as an intellectual principle is a liability. Faith will always keep you from getting the truth is a position taken by these people. And I don't know, because the empirical method is so fruitful in many ways, I don't know if Christian people and Christian scholars have inspected the philosophical foundations of their own training adequately to realize the extent to which the empirical philosophy that they submit to is based on the principle that intellectually Faith is a liability rather than an asset. I, John Pilkey, regard faith, intellectual faith, as an asset. 
I'm an affirmer primarily, not a denier. And I've met many Christian deniers. Trained in secular universities in empirical and skeptical modes of thought or in Christian institutions, following trends set by the empiricists. They have sometimes failed to recognize that divine inspiration extends to the design of such passages, such as Revelation 2.3, and not just to the factualness of the bits of information which they contain. This empirical suspicion against pattern, rhythm, or design can be traced back to the early Protestant repudiation of Roman Catholic symbolism. The Catholic system is very rich in symbols and is especially apparent in the works of the Protestant philosopher Francis Bacon, popularizer of the scientific method. A key example of this habitual skepticism is the way second or third generation dispensation, this is a good example, note this well, the way second or third generation dispensationalists, people in other words who feel that they have to carry on the dispensational tradition even though they don't see it as clearly as the founders of dispensationalism did, these second or third generation dispensationalists will concede too quickly that the seven dispensation scheme is unimportant as long as one grasps the simple distinction between the church and Israel. In other words, they, they want to avoid the details of dispensationalism because of this empirical, rooted empirical suspiciousness toward elaborated systems or control diversity as they call it. In, in the absence of feeling for schemes, certain, such as Revelation 2.3, certain things happen or fail to happen to the human mind. The popular, superficial, democratic, evangelical approach to the age-old problem of the one and the many is merely that God is one and we are many, and that the schemes I have named from Scripture are random sample quantities like any other. Is the Trinity a set of three, a random sample quantity? Hardly. Neither are the four faculties of the great commandment, the seven virtues of 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, the seven churches of Revelation 2, 3, or the body of nations created by Noah's family after the flood. Patterns and schemes are a factor in Genesis 1 through 11. Dr. George Howe, about a decade ago, showed me an article questioning the historicity of early Genesis pr precisely because of the pattern recurrence of 30-year generations in the genealogy of Genesis 11. The empirical prejudice against schemes was so intense in the case of this article that its author never considered the simple explanation that these 30-year generations were dictated by a traditional scheme among the family of Noah. Never considered it, never crossed his mind. The author jumped to the conclusion that such patterning could only originate with the poetic fantasy of the biblical author. As a professional student of literature, I recognize that poetic fantasy, a capacity to operate in a context of schemes and symbols, is often a direct route to the truth. And as a student of the Noahic world community, I can assure you that the high-spirited family of Noah were far more inclined toward poetic fantasy and ritual scheming than was the chastened and sober author of the book of Genesis, no doubt Moses, chastened by the law. The schemes that we find in Genesis are a result of its subject matter, the people that it's writing about, not its explicit viewpoint. And if you're getting all the ritual and the symbolism, the structure and so forth from the high-spirited third millennium, not from the low-spirited, chastened, justly legalized mosaic second millennium, there's a big difference between Noah and Moses. And you can see that between the authorial view viewpoint of Genesis, which is very, very sober, and the subject matter, which in many ways is extremely exotic and high-spirited. Aside from patterning in the genealogies, other schemes recur in early Genesis, especially tetrad schemes as sets of four. The four-river antediluvian cosmos in Genesis 2 Four males at the first generation of Adam's family, Adam himself, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Four male survivors of the flood. Four female survivors. The natural pattern of the four seasons in the post-Diluvian setting of Genesis 
the four sons of Javan in 10.4 and the four sons of Ham in 10.6. Furthermore, classic Middle Eastern geography was reducible to a tetrad. The Sumerians distinguished clearly between the upper and lower seas, that is, between the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. Both they and the Hebrews of the Bible distinguished further according to the polarity of land and sea, so the Hellenic Isles of the Gentiles formed the duad with the interior lands of the Western Semites and the peoples of the Indian Ocean with the interior of Mesopotamia. So you count up, it's four. Two at the lower sea, two at the upper sea. This geographic tetrad holds the key to the implicit racial tetrad of Adam's, Adam's family in that blacks and yellows, which have one, those two races have one basic trait in common, and that's the facial convexity, or what we call high cheekbones, dominate the outer sphere of the lower sea and the reds and whites, the sphere of the upper sea. These recurrent tetrads in early Genesis are not what Francis Bacon and the Baconians would have thought. Impositions of the author's human love of symmetry on natural and irregular data. That's the general Baconian scientific attitude towards any text, ancient text especially, that would betray symmetrical patterning. They would jump to the conclusion, in keeping with certain jumping that Francis Bacon did, that any kind of patterning or regularity or symmetry, again, would come from the subjective mind of the author. Francis Bacon had an opinion about this. He thought that humanity had a bias, an irrational bias, toward symmetry. And he tells you this at one point in the Advancement of Learning, and this has colored uh, sophisticated scientific human thought ever since. And it's an attitude that has been very fruitful in some ways because there often is a good deal of irregularity in some subjects, non-symmetry in some subjects, but in other subjects it simply destroyed them because some subjects are inherently symmetrical in nature. Some subject matters have symmetry to them. These patterns that I've been dealing with here, and I've named some of them, a lot of the tetrad patterns, are inherent in the data itself and result from the imposition of symmetry on human history by the same God who inspired four Gospels. Now, you see, you have to make the decision right there. If you have the Baconian attitude towards uh, symmetry, feeling that it results from a kind of subjective human instinct or something, then you turn to the uh, Tetrad of the New Testament, the four Gospels, and you conclude that the same things that work there, and what do you do? You conclude that, uh, well, what the critics and the, and the anti-biblicists today do, and that's simply that, that uh, the four gospel, one of them originated maybe in the first century, uh, maybe another one in the second, another one in the fifth, and that the gospel of John was very late and represented Hellenic speculation, the rest of it. In other words, you just basically reject the, the authority of the text and even its integrity, even its honesty, because you just cannot believe that the God of reality and that reality itself has that type of symmetry in it, that a real God would actually design a revelation in four distinct narratives concerning his son. That's too symmetrical to please a Baconian, and the result is just a hash of one's rendering or interpretation of the meaning of the four Gospels. That the statement I make here in my manuscript, we either have a faith in the God of symmetry or we do not. The medieval Roman Catholics had such a faith. The Baconian Protestants lost that aspect of faith. They retained a sola scriptura loyalty to the Bible, but that did not mean that they retained all aspects of the Christian faith. One aspect of the Christian faith that they lost and that I've discovered repeatedly in dealing with evangelicals and evangelical leaders is that the Protestants have lost their faith in a God of symmetry. They've lost their faith in that dimension of divine reality so that when they see symmetry, there's an underlying element of wrath and doubting in their reaction to it. We either have a faith in a God of symmetry or we do not. The fact that our ancestors have sometimes erred on the side of symmetry, which is easy to do because we're sinners, 
And the sin nature means a capacity to make errors, to exaggerate certain points, to emphasize, to, to de-emphasize things we ought to emphasize and vice versa. So we're sinners, we're mistake makers, and the fact that our ancestors have sometimes erred on the side of symmetry does not mean that we should abandon symmetry as a dimension of the mind of God. Bacon, under the impact of the Reformation, did that very thing, declaring in a passage of advancement of learning that because he could see no actual patterns in the stars, and obviously they look very irregular in their distribution, of course that's kind of the trees rather than the wood, because if you see the wood, we realize that all the visible stars are in the, are in the galaxy, and the galaxies at least have pinwheel form, so if you put it all together, the irregularly distributed stars do form a large structure that does have a form to it, a, kind of like a wheel or a, or you know, a disk, and that's at least some form. It's not a, it's not as much as people would see in the arbitrary uh, designs uh, of the of the constellations. Uh, so uh, Bacon's point is well taken. The the apparent distribution of the stars is a, is a revelation of God's capacity to work through the irregular or the undesigned or the non-symmetrical. But then he jumps fatally the, to the conclusion that that dimension of irregularity or randomness, which is a factor in the universe, is reality itself. And that is a counter superstition. That is just as false as the most superstitious conclusion that can ever be drawn. Do we understand that? Yes, a superstitious man can be overly symmetrical and he can, he can feign symmetry or he can assume symmetry where it does not exist. But there's a negativistic type of denying skeptical superstition, call it anti-superstition, or super, superstition turned upside down, in which a man concludes arbitrarily and fanatically that symmetry is never true, and that because there are four Gospels, they must be false simply because there are four of them, and there are too many tetrad systems in uh, the scriptures uh, to, to uh, give one's faith to. You see how blind that is? How that's, that's the old medieval superstition simply in a new form. Because your, superst your ancestors were sinners and they sinned in the area of symmetry. You superstitiously go over to asymmetry as a sign of reality. And it is absolutely superstitious. You see? <laughs> it, it, you've got to have balance. You've got to have some sense of the reality of the irregular and the reality of the regular and keep your eye open for how to balance them and notice wh where they balance and be ready to march in the direction of symmetry when God calls us to symmetry and be ready to march in the direction of irregularity and randomness when God calls us to deal with that sort of reality. The difference really is rather dispensational. You might say that the realm of the, the chaotic or the irregular has a lot to do with the dispensation of conscience, with the effects of the fall in other words and with life before the flood, a life of violence in which you have to think on your feet and adjust to confusing asymmetrical uh, circumstances. It's just part of life. Uh, and then you come into the realm of order when you enter, you know, again, pass beyond the flood into the dispensation of human government when the nations were being set up, and there's a great deal of symmetry in that subject matter because God is creating a cosmos, a design. Now, uh, the conclusion drawn by early Protestants was that Catholicism was idolatrous and worldly. In other words, Catholicism was kind of a caricature of the early post-Diluvian world in Christian garb. That's how they saw it. And therefore, because Catholicism was magnificent and civilized and designed and organized and symmetrical, the Protestants falsely conclude that God loves chaos and plunge themselves back into the antediluvian primitivistic irregular world. And you can see Francis Bacon do it in 1605 in the earliest generations of intellectual Protestantism as people are trying to adapt to the Protestant worldview. Now, the dispensation of conscience was part of God's plan and therefore a realm of chaos is part of God's plan is in terms of reality, in terms of what happened as a result of the fall. So we're not in, we're not in heaven, we're on earth. And because we're not in heaven, we don't see. We don't see as much symmetry as is possible and I believe is real in heaven. The result is we turn around and we say reality is chaos, reality is disorder, reality is randomness, and all we're doing is putting ourselves back into the second dispensation. Bacon, Francis Bacon, 
under the impact of the Reformation, did that very thing, declaring in a passage of advancement of learning that because he could see no actual patterns in the stars, God must be inherently alien to symmetry. That was a fatal mistake that led straight to Darwinism two centuries later. That and certain other factors in the Baconian tradition laid the groundwork for the victory, the social victory, the apostate victory of Darwinism, which is the supreme effort to worship the god of forces or mere causation without any sense of design whatsoever. Symmetry is one of the givens of the universe revealing, as all realities do, some of the character of God himself. Those who really hate symmetry are aesthetic atheists. And for the most part, they're just atheists. They just don't believe in God because the realm of disorder seems so real to them. Failure and negative result and chaos, uh, the realm of what sin has done is so real to their consciences that they simply exclude a God of order and design and civilization from, their, from the way that they conceive reality. And this simply takes the form of an atheist doubt of God's existence. Because God is orderly. Because he does do things decently and in order. Those who are indecent and disorderly cannot believe in him. That brings us to the part of Genesis 10 study that pertains to high theology, to God himself. Because of the centrality of God, the most important of all the schemes pertains to the diverse names of God in the Hebrew Old Testament. Here we go again. Symmetry versus asymmetry and the voice of asymmetry. Anti-biblical skeptics, the original higher critics, made classic use of this pattern in setting a Yahwist author against an Elohist. You know, the basis of that, that there are a couple of different creation accounts in early Genesis, just one after the other. And one of them attributes the creation to Elohim, the other one to Yahweh. Now, with a feeling for symmetry and order and for God revealing himself through symmetry, I conclude that there is a, an Elohim dimension of God and a Yahweh dimension of God that this was mediated to ethnic groups, that Yahweh was the God of the Canaanites and that Elohim was the God of the Abelites, and that what you have in, in Moses' record is two different testimonies, one coming from the land of Havilah, the land that worshipped God as Elohim, and the other one coming from the land of Nod or the land of Cain, wherever that was, uh, dealing with, a, uh, a dealing with a, an account uh, based on uh, the name Yahweh whose name is linked directly to Cain at the time of his birth. But that's not, not how the higher critics reason. Again, they reason in the Baconian tradition that this very symmetry comes from the human mind and the human heart because somehow symmetry has deceived us before and it must be something that comes from us rather than reality. And that is a counter-superstition. It is a counter-superstition, an anti-symmetrical superstition. And so they claimed, of course, that uh, uh, Moses is not in control of anything, that what you're doing is pa patching together traditions uh, uh, from later Jewish times in which you have one myth conceived by people who happen to worship um, Elohim and another, uh, another myth conceived by people who worship Yahweh in the later history of Israel, and it has nothing to do with the subject matter. And I say it has everything to do with the subject matter. Yes, there was an Elohist sect, and a Yahweh sect, but those sects were created by God in the community of Adam among the diverse elements that were in the community of Adam. There were four races that came out of Adam's family and four lands, and you can see that in the cemetery of Genesis 2. In other words, nobody among the higher critics and their followers seemed to recognize that Adam, Cain, Abel, and Seth formed diverse racial stocks inhabiting the four zones described in Genesis 2 and following four divinely ordained religious cults distinguished by the divine names such as Elohim, Yahweh, El Elyon, El Shaddai, and there are four more. Yet plenty of scriptural evidence exists to suggest such a grand theocratic scheme. Now here you have to put in a caveat. Because of my feeling for symmetry, I have posited in my own mind, thinking artistically, a grand theocratic scheme to account for these diverse names scattered through the Old Testament. But I have to acknowledge from the very outset that no passage of Scripture does this. There is no passage of Scripture 
that ties together and coordinates the various names of God in the Old Testament. And the question then is, where do these names arise? And those who love asymmetry, the Baconians, will jump to the conclusion that these are just loose, casual metaphors for the monotheistic God of Israel, and that they carry very little significance, and that uh, the God of Abraham just happens to be called El Shaddai, and the God of Melchizedek, Kizedek just happens to be called El Elyon, and that the God of Shem just happens to be called Yahweh Elohim, Lord God. But that that's a very superficial reality. And when I posit a symmetry to explain it, I'm showing my faith, and you might say the daring of my faith in a God of symmetry, that there is some key to it all. There is some underlying pattern that is then shattered and the scriptures are testifying faithfully to both sides of the picture. They're testifying to the names of God that are part of this grand theocratic scheme. But they're also testifying candidly and in a tactful way to the, the refuse of it all. Because this grand theocratic scheme had no salvation potential in it that is among the Gentiles. Because salvation is not of the Gentiles, it's of the Jews. And if the scriptures had shown the integrity of this scheme out of which those divine names come, that is, that there was a coordination, a symmetry about El Elyon and the different names of God, that may have suggested that there was some potentiality left in the Noahic community, that is, the Gentile world, to save itself, that some salvation plan would come from the Egyptians or might come from the Greeks. And it wasn't to be that way. We know what had to happen. Christ had to be incarnated among the Jews after the giving of the law, and then he had to complete the work of the law uh, on the cross and, and uh, atone for our sins through his blood. And all of that had relatively nothing to do. It had something to do, but, it, but the, the divine theocratic scheme that I allege did not lead in the direction of that. It was a pre-revelation of something heavenly, but it didn't lead anywhere. And the result is that the scriptures give us a balance between symmetry and asymmetry. They give us the refuse of those divine names. They give us those different names of God, but they don't bring them together at one point. And that's very typical of the total and balanced and omniscient viewpoint at work in the scriptures, that God knows how to work through symmetry, and he knows how to work through asymmetry. And those who follow his mind know how to balance the claims of the two uh, in a realistic way, admitting that because of the fall, we're not in heaven, and earth isn't heaven, and therefore the amount of symmetry available to us is very limited. Well, I say nevertheless that plenty of scriptural evidence exists to suggest such a grand theocratic scheme, meaning a scheme in which eight names of God, and the total is eight in my opinion, and it correlates with the eight survivors of the flood, eight names of God were at one time coordinated at one time, they formed a pattern something like the High Sumerian Pantheon. But as I say, that led nowhere because the Gentiles went nowhere spiritually. And all we see is the, are the relics of it in the diversified names of God in the Old Testament. But to give evidence for this grand theocratic scheme, in Genesis 4, the patriarchs Cain and Abel are segregated with Eve as though some systematic process were at work. It's rather mysterious. It looks like the vestiges of a cemetery, unstated, but nevertheless there, because two of the sons are segregated with Eve. And at the out you can read the text for yourself to see what I mean by segregated with Eve. And at the outset of the fifth chapter, Seth and Adam are segregated in the same way. That's this underlying cemetery, you see. Something, some cemetery working beneath uh, the flow of the narrative that appears in the narrative, but it appears in an unexplained way, you see? See, vestiges of an order, a divine order, which was forfeited by the chaos of the sinfulness of the Gentile people, because we're dealing with the ancestors of the Gentiles here. Cain at his birth is associated with the name Yahweh, the God of justice, later linked to the law of Moses. Now, now I'm bringing out a meaningful, symmetrical fact about Cain and the name Yahweh. The scriptural evidence is simply that Cain is identified with Yahweh at his birth in the text. But now I'm bringing out a reinforcement to show that that meant something. And it meant something because of an underlying symmetrical relationship between Cain, the Cainites, and the name Yahweh. The history of Cain's murder of Abel 
raises the issue of justice in a systematically appropriate way, as though Cain were singled out to bear the load of guilt or sin consciousness, later inspired by the law of Moses. And of course, the name Yahweh was given back to Moses. You see, see the picture here? You have Yahweh with Cain. You later have Yahweh Elohim with Shem. Then the name Yahweh disappears. You have El Shaddai with Abraham. You have uh, El Elyon with Melchizedek. But then the name Yahweh and that, you know, I am that I am is given back at Sinai to Moses. Why? Because Moses was to receive the law. And what is the law? The conviction of sins. 